personal finance PowerPoint presentation. Common stock. Prepare to get financially fit by practicing personal finance. Most of this information can be found at Investopedia Common Stock, which you can find online. Take a look at the references, resources, continue your research from there. This by James Chen, updated April 27, 2022. In prior presentations, we've been taking a look at our investment goals, investment strategies. Now we're given an overview of what is Common Stock. Common stock is a security that represents ownership in a corporation. Holders of common stock elect the board of directors and vote on corporate policies. So when we're thinking about investing in common stock, we're usually thinking about common stock for corporations that are on an exchange, therefore usually larger corporations that are publicly traded corporations. When we look at the structure of a corporation, we can compare it to say a democratic republic, for example. If we were to vote in a democratic republic, we don't vote on the actual policies, the day-to-day -day policies that are being made, but instead we vote for people to represent us who hopefully will then go and make policy decisions on our behalf acting in a way as our agents. Obviously, there's kind of problems with that to the extent that people that are supposed to be acting on our behalf sometimes act on their own behalf, and that's an agency type of problem. Similar kind of thing could happen with a corporation. We've got the structure of the corporation where we are basically the owners, although if we have a small number of shares, we have a small kind of power for our voting power in a similar way as if we're voting in a democratic republic, we could vote for then the board of directors. The board of directors then could be hiring management and management are the people that are actually gonna be running uh, the day-to-day -day types of operations, hopefully acting as agents on behalf of the owners, which are the shareholders. How do they do that? They make money. They should be making decisions that grow the company and make money. So this form of, equi of uh, equity ownership typically yields higher rates of return long term. So when you compare investing in stocks versus other types of investments like bonds or savings accounts accumulating interest, the stocks over the long term typically do better, although of course there's more risk related to it. However, in the event of liquidation, common shareholders have rights to a company's assets only after bondholders, preferred shareholders, and other debt holders are paid in full. So in other words, if the corporation liquidates, they go out of business. In other words, they go basically bankrupt, for example, then the common stockholders are actually at the end because they're kind of the owners of the corporation. The corporation has made commitments to other people such as bondholders. So if we were to hold corporate bonds and the company liquidated, we would be paid first. As a sh corporate shareholder, we're betting not on the company liquidating, we're betting on the company growing. And as the company grows, we would then benefit from having you know, an increase in the common stock price as well as possible more dividends that could be paid out. If we own bonds in a corporation, then we get a fixed amount of, of, of return. And if the company grows, it's not gonna increase basically the amount of return because the, the, the terms of the bond have already been set. But if the company was to liquidate, go out of business, they pay the bondholders before the, the stockholders, unless the government comes in and says they're too big to fail and they do something funny. So common stock is reported in the stockholders equity section of a company's balance sheet. So when you look at the balance sheet, it's kind of like a personal balance sheet, assets minus liability, liabilities is uh, equity or kind of you could think of it as net assets. Understanding common stock, common stock represents a residual claim to a company's ongoing and future profits. As such, shareholders are said to be part owners in a company. So once again, common stock represents a residual claim to a company's ongoing and future profits. So when you're looking at the common stock, you're looking for them to basically grow, generate more revenue in the future, and you having kind of an equity interest, a claim in that growth in that value of the company. So this does not mean that shareholders can walk into a company's office and claim ownership of a portion of the chairs or desks or computers. So in other words, you as the common stockholder, clearly we could say, well, if I have a claim to the assets of the company, I should be able to just say, give me some money. And if I was in a sole proprietorship, for example, that's kind of how it works. You could say, I'm just gonna draw out some money whenever I kind of feel like it. But when you're talking about a corporation, the idea of the shares, which was a genius idea, was that we're gonna make all the shares the same. 
so that so that we can't have one shareholder basically pulling out money from the from the company unless it's going to be kind of the same you know the shares have to have equal kind of rights that's why they can be traded on the exchange and we can know the value of those shares which allows other people to basically invest and increase the pool of capital available and the ability for investors to invest so these things are owned by the corporation itself which is the legal entity note that a corporation we call it a legal entity which is another really big kind of step in terms of of increase in the economy a lot of people would say in that the corporations we give it kind of rights that we would have as a human being we kind of as humans allocate some rights that we would think of if you think of natural rights theories we would think of as a natural right to own property being something for a human being that we give to artificially to a corporation that then has its own legal so now it's its own legal entity that basically owns has ownership of the assets so instead the shareholders owns uh, this residual claim common stock is traded on exchanges and may be bought and sold by investors or traders shareholders of common stock may be entitled to receive dividends so clearly when we're investing common stock we're trying to have the stock price go up and because all the stocks are the same that means that that the value of, of any one stock any one trade can kind of give us an idea of the full value of all the stocks because they're kind of like currency in that case they're the same that's what allows them to be more liquid and tradable uh, and we also might want the dividends which would be the corporation deciding to pay money out to the shareholders if it was a sole proprietor we would call that draws we could just take money out whenever we wanted to if it was our own small business but corporations have to determine whether or not they're going to pay out dividends they may not pay out dividends if they're in a growing spurt because they would rather keep those dividends invest them back in the company and give value back to the shareholders by growing the company companies that have already been grown they're they're at the peak of their of their curve and are just kind of moving along at at, at a good pace might give more dividends something like a, like an energy company or something that's well established like an edison or something like that so the first ever common stock was established in 1602 by the dutch east india company and introduced on the uh, amsterdam stock exchange over the following 400 plus years stock markets have appeared around the world with tens of thousands of companies listed on global stock exchanges such as the london stock exchange and the tokyo stock exchange among others larger u.s based stocks are traded on a public exchange such as the new york stock exchange that's the nyse or the nasdaq nasdaq as of q1 2022 quarter one the new york stock exchange had 7417 listings with a market capitalization totaling around 53 trillion dollars making it the biggest stock exchange in the world by market cap there are also several uh, international exchanges for foreign stocks companies that are smaller in size and unable to meet an exchange's listing requirements are considered unlisted these unlisted stocks are said to be traded over the counter otc so notice when you get into basically trading on the exchanges then the exchange itself has has incentives to try to say i don't we, we want to make things as transparent as possible and one of the reasons the u.s exchanges have done quite well over the years is that that when you when you put the they have the regulations that say that you, you have to be somewhat transparent when you put the information on the exchange meaning you have to have your reports lined up in a way that people can understand in in a way that can be comparable and that then if you can have transparency with corporations because the corporations are looking for capital when they put it on the exchange they're looking for people to invest in the company so if they want that capital because they don't have to do that they could not go corporate and then they don't then right so if they want the capital they got to be transparent with the people they're asking money from and present their information in such a way that those investors can compare it with other corporations and decide where to put their money that transparency has really increased the U.S.'s capacity to to bring in capital to to the companies, even though we don't have as much growth potential at this point than you would think industrializing companies that are still in their in, industrializing countries that are still in kind of their growth phase. You would think that they would be able to grow faster to catch up to where we are at, given the fact that they're kind of we're, we've kind of trotted the trail already. So if they just follow the wake 
they can probably grow faster, but the U.S. still gets a huge component of uh, of capital investment in part because of that transparency of the ex exchanges and the trust that's involved in it. So special considerations, corporate bankruptcy. So with common stock, if a company goes bankrupt, the common stockholders do not receive their money until the creditors, bondholders, or preferred shareholders have received their respective shares. So the benefit of being a bondholder, for example, is that you typically get paid first and you have more of a guaranteed kind of amount that you will be paid. If you're a shareholder, then you're hoping that the, your benefit is that the, that the value goes up in the company and you get paid more through dividends and increase in the valuation of the stock. So this makes common stock riskier than debt or preferred shares. The upside to common shares is, is they usually outperform bonds and preferred shares in the long run. So clearly if the company does good, then you're gonna, get, you're gonna have a better deal on the common stocks, but that comes with risk. So many companies issue all three types of securities. For example, Wells Fargo, a company has several bonds available on the secondary market. So it also has preferred stock, such as its serial L, the New York Stock Exchange, WFCL, and common stock, uh, WFC, IPOs. For a company to issue stock, it must begin by having an initial public offering known as an IPO. An IPO is a great way for a company uh, seeking additional capital to expand. To begin the IPO process, a company must work with an underwriting investment banking firm, which helps determine both the type and pricing of the stock. After the IPO phase is completed, the general public is allowed to purchase the new stock on the secondary market. Common stock and investors. Stock should be considered an important part of any investor's portfolios. So clearly stocks are, are some a big part of the portfolio. Note, however, that oftentimes people get kind of confused between common stocks and then buying mutual funds and buying index funds, for example. And so just note that, you know, oftentimes these things are using the common stocks. If you look at a mutual fund, that's just a format of buying the common stocks that allows people, common people oftentimes, to be able to have a diversified portfolio, even though they don't have the same kind of funds as a wealthy individual so that they can pool the money together. That's the idea, pool the money together so that the pooled assets can then buy the underlying you know, common stock. So we're still buying, in essence, common stock, but we're doing so not one at a time, one individual common stock for one individual company at a time, but instead using tools, mutual funds to pool money together, making it more affordable to buy the common stocks and be diversified. So there are also several types of stocks. Growth stocks are companies that tend to increase in value due to growing earnings. Value stocks are companies uh, lower in price in relation to their fundamentals. So then you can start to think about, you know, what are the different categories of stocks and where do we want to put our money you might be trying to think about where the stock is in their life cycle so as we as we talked about it's similar in in countries it's similar in companies in that you have this kind of growth phase a country goes through the kind of the industrial phase you know if they're growing and you know and sometimes and some companies don't grow some companies and some countries tend to stagnate and so on why does that happen but if a company was going through a growth phase and you're imagining that they're going to be a big company or country, right? They're going to go through, the country will go through in, the industrialization, right? And then they'll, then they'll get to post-industrial and so on. And then if you're talking about a company that makes it, then they're going to have a, a high growth phase and then they're going to ta taper off up top. So what you would like to do, ideally, if you had a crystal ball, is to be purchasing the companies that are going to make it at that growth phase because that's when you would if you purchased apple when it jumped up that would be the time to do it but nobody knows when that is and a lot of those companies don't actually make it and then you can think about a more conservative investing investing in stocks that have already made it and are actually doing quite well they're just they're just plowing along like like the utilities company or possibly an apple at this point in time and so on and so 
So value stocks offer a dividend unlike uh, growth stocks. Stocks are categorized by market capitalization, either large, mid, or small. Large cap stocks are much more heavily traded and <clears throat> are generally an indication of a more stable company. Small cap stocks are usually newer companies looking to grow, so they can be much more volatile compared to large caps. So your objective when you look at these is saying, okay, if I'm looking at a company that's are growing, companies that are growing, there's more risk involved there. So I have to compare that to my time horizon. How does that fit into my portfolio? If I'm looking at stocks that have already been matured and they're doing well, and they're at the end of kind of their, their cycle and they're just going along, they're probably gonna give more dividends. And you might think about those kind of stocks and your overall mix. And again, this overall mix concept might be able to do do that with different kinds of tools like mutual funds for example possibly targeted mutual funds for example that can change over the time horizon uh, of your savings so how does common stock differ from preferred stock common stock is the most widely available type of shares issued by a company and what you will likely encounter when trading stocks on an exchange so clearly usually when you think about stocks and investing in the market you're talking common stocks so these shares typically come with voting rights, but are the last uh, in line, the preferred ordering of being repaid if a company goes bankrupt. So the benefit of the common stocks is you've got that voting capacity. Although again, if you have small shares, just like voting in a democratic republic, then you don't have a lot of influence, but that's you got that voting capacity and you have the claim to the equity, but you're last in line to get paid if the company goes bankrupt and they're trying to liquidate, just pay off all their assets to who they owe money to. Preferred shares come ahead of common stock in that ordering. So the preferred shares, that's the idea of them being preferred. The name's a little bit dis, uh, misleading because you might think if you, ha if you knew nothing else and someone said, you can get a common stock or a preferred stock and you'd say, well, the preferred stock sounds better but you know it's not always better it's preferred in that there's less risk in the event that there's a bankruptcy you're going to get paid first but if the company does well and outperforms and grows then the the return you get on the common stock could be better so preferred doesn't necessarily mean better it's not like you got everything you got on the common stock plus something else it's something different so preferred shares also often lack voting rights so you don't have the same kind of voting rights but do come with a regular and higher dividend payments. In this respect, preferred shares are sometimes considered to be a hybrid between bonds and common stock. So notice when you think about bonds, you're usually investing in something where you have a guaranteed return or more guaranteed return, and you know what the terms of that return are. And you, if, if, there's, a, if there's liquidation, then you get paid basically first. I believe the preferred stock is that if there was a liquidation, it's kind of in the middle. And, uh, the, and then you also have the, the dividends, which usually get paid first on the dividends, but the company might still have some say in terms of what their dividend policy will be. So uh, how can I use common stock to vote at company meetings? Most ordinary common shares uh, come with one vote per share, granting shareholders the right to vote on corporate actions often conducted a company's meeting of shareholders. Uh, if you cannot attend, you can choose to cast your vote by proxy instead, whereby a third party will vote on your behalf along with others who cannot attend. Votes may be held on issues such as whether to merge with or acquire a company to elect members of the board of directors or to approve stock splits or dividends so why is common stock referred to as an equity common stock represents a residual ownership stake in a company a company maintains a balance sheet com uh, composed of assets and liabilities assets are the things the company owns or uh, is entitled to such as its property equipment cash reserves and accounts receivable on the other side of the balance sheet are liabilities which are what the company owes. These includes uh, payables, debts, and other obligations. If a company is healthy, the total assets will be larger than the total liabilities. Uh, what is left over is the residual amount left to the owners known as shareholders equity. So you might ask, you know, why do people refer to it as equity? And, and if, you were to, if you were to think about the value of the company, the first calculation you might make is say well how much assets do you have minus how many liabilities do you have 
you look at the balance sheet to do that the difference between those two is equity from the accounting equation standpoint we see it as assets equal liabilities plus equity because assets represent what the company has liabilities and equity represents who the company owes those assets to as a separate legal entity either a third party like the bank for loans for example or the owners the shareholders the equity the actual company itself is just a shell it doesn't really own you know it owns stuff because we gave it the capacity to as owners right that artificial right of ownership that's a human right f from a natural law perspective given it to the company artificially but if you think about them as a separate entity every assets that they have they're going to eventually pay out to somebody either a third party for obligations they took on liabilities or the owners the shareholders that third part assets minus liabilities is equity and so that's kind of like the net value